Hey everyone, before we get into today's volume, I wanted to say a very Merry Christmas to every one of you listening. It's a very huge pleasure to have you and your company. Today we have Noel Whitaker, which happens to be the word for Christmas. Happy 2021. Previously on the psychology of entrepreneurship, I'm Paul Dunn. Right now I'm in Singapore. And it's, uh, what is it? Three days after my birthday. There you go. It's the 2nd of December. And he said, at enlightened companies, leaders are smart enough to ask, how do we make things better for our customers? Guess what? It, it shouldn't take us too long to figure out that guilt is not something that we want to feel every day. We don't. We just don't. It's not a good look, right? But what we do want to feel every day is joy. That's what we want to feel. It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, the human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. You are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hey, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. I'm Australian and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging of the land I am standing on today. I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who listen to this podcast. With COVID-19 in 2020, there is no hiding the fact that people everywhere have been losing jobs. Money, finances and businesses are changing quite dramatically. There are some recent numbers to consider. These are statistics from the U.S. Department of Labor released on Friday, December 5th, 2020. So very recent. It states, amongst other things, in November, the number of long-term unemployed, those jobless for 27 weeks or more, increased by 385,000 to 3.9 million accounting for 36.9% of the total unemployed, while the number of persons jobless between 15 to 26 weeks declined by 760,000 to 1.9 million. While I'm giving you these statistics, it's important to give you the others as well. The number of persons jobless between five to 14 weeks and persons jobless less than five weeks showed little change in November at 2.4 million and 2.5 million respectively. That's a lot of numbers to tell you that a lot of people are unemployed right now. So I want to talk with... Well, Noel Whittaker's my name. I'm multi-skilled, I guess. I've been a a banker, a lawyer, a recruiter, a property developer, a finance broker. And we built the biggest financial planning business in Queensland with 100 staff, which we sold in 2013, plus a full-time author now. So it's, you know, it's a lot of experience in there. Noel Whitaker is 81 years young. Seen a lot, been through a lot an author of 24 books. Noel, by the way, is pronounced Noel. Not like here in Australia where people say Noel, hashtag just saying. So I'm going to call him Noel through the whole volume. Do you consider yourself lucky, Mr. Wedeka? Certainly. Absolutely. But lucky, but I mean, I've worked... I've worked very hard to get where I am now, I can tell you, but I've also been lucky doing that too. I had a mentor who became one of the wealthiest men. He's actually the guy we used to buy our blocks of land from. And uh, I, I asked him once, uh, what's his secret? He said, uh, a bit of luck, being there at the right time and doing the right thing by the other bloke. 
And I believe that implicitly. I do believe what goes around comes around. Implicitly. I believe in Emerson's law of compensation. Implicitly. The money has started to flow after the release of a federal budget filled with record spending. Hundreds of billions of dollars will be injected into the economy to try to minimise the damage of the recession. It's all built on tax cuts worth between $20 and $50 a week, wage subsidies of up to $200 a week for almost half a million young workers, $30 billion in tax incentives to get business investment. This coverage is extremely dramatised, with the journalist using a passive-aggressive tone to possibly get more people to worry. But it seems like it is a political sway. Anyway... The point is... Digital editor Andrew Probin joins us now from Parliament House. Andrew, the government's trying to inject some confidence into the economy. Has it done enough, do you think, to achieve a lasting recovery? Well, we need a, it all depends on the, uh, the assumptions, and the assumptions uh, go from the lifting of borders, the fact that companies will invest billions, that consumers will spend their tax cuts, and a vaccine will be found. Now, even if all of those are realised, Australia is going to be a poorer, it's going to be a smaller and an uh, older country for years to come. We Australians are spending for sure. Walk around Brisbane on a Friday and Saturday night and you can't tell that the world is going through a global pandemic. Black Friday was also obviously huge around the world. So people are spending money that isn't really there. Here's a view from another report by Sky News. This was one of those moments in time when if the government didn't spend the money and sadly they have to borrow the money to spend the money, then millions of people are unemployed. The older you are, the less chance you have of returning to a job. So if there is a philosophy, an idea, a bumper sticker, a slogan, a theory, at the heart of this, it is to make sure that as many people as possible can hold on by their fingernails and then turn that fingernail grip into one where they can start to lift themselves up on the monkey bars and eventually get back into the game. That is going to cost us eye-watering numbers. Listening to that, I feel extremely lucky that I don't have a job. I feel extremely lucky that I get to create jobs for others. But while I was thinking about all that and focusing on my team who always come first, by the way. Noel reminded me about the principles of business. And he did it with a story. So I think in a business, you, 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 you've, got to be, you've got to be customer focused. You've got to make it easy to do business with you. And most people, it's hard to do business with. And you must understand the value of a customer. Now, I've been a Lexus car owner until recently when I, got, when I changed to Tesla, but I've been a Lexus owner for many, many years. I always went to their, you know, they have golf days and events. And uh, the warranty on the car expired and they, and, and they hadn't told me. And I rang up and they said, oh, we can't. And I forced them to give me the warranty. And then I said to the, the head of Lexus in Australia, I said, how come that, you don't get the invitations to golf clubs anymore. Ari said, once the car's out of warranty, you're just off the books. And I said, wouldn't the most obvious targets be people whose Lexus cars were out of warranty, not the new Lexus owners? And they couldn't even see that. I mean, I sell books online, you know, if... They get the wrong book, which happens sometimes they get the wrong book. I say, look, please keep it. I'm sorry about it. We'll send you another one. I'm not going to, they all, I say, you know, I don't say send it back. You know, the more you give, the more you get back. So you've got to be in a business. A, a you've got to have a need. Now, I spoke to a woman recently. She was a lawyer. She's now a very attractive 34-year-old. She's a millionaire. She discovered that most tannings were hopeless, so she commissioned a industrial chemist and she got a tanning thing and now she's in shopping centres all over the world based, in, based from Brisbane. In a 2017 report conducted by Microsoft, 
they found that 96% of respondents believe that customer service is important in their choice of loyalty to a brand. With any advice you get, it is important to get the perspective of where that advice is coming from. What kind of person is shedding light on what subject? Well, I'm a positive person, I think. Uh, And I've also learned that something that you wanted that didn't happen, the fact that it didn't happen was one of the best things ever because it's the universe taking you somewhere else. I mean, I think of a couple of girls I could have married and didn't, thank God, you know. I think of a couple of (laughs) jobs I applied for and I didn't get, thank God, you know. You look back on your life and all these things that could have happened didn't happen and I believe in the universe. I always say, well, what's the universe's plan? And I say that daily. Noel, what was it like growing up? When I was a kid, I dreamed of being someone. When I was five or six, I dreamed of having my own radio show. Uh, At the age of 10, I was selling milk to the school teachers. My father managed a pig farm, so uh, I would sell pork. I got to high school and sold the teachers eggs. At 16, I had my own honey brand. Now, these are very tiny enterprises, but I think that entrepreneurial things always been there. And really, I have always given my job everything. And I think where I've been different to many people is that I've never stopped giving it everything. There's a wonderful story about um, the head of the biggest railway company was, was on the train. I forget his name, but he was the head of that railway company. We're going back 100 years. And it pulled up at a siding and there was a worker on the line and they greeted each other. And someone said, what's the difference? They said, well, the executive went to work for the railway. The other bloke went to, went to work for himself. I've always given everything. Uh, I'm a big fan of Andrew Carnegie in his autobiography. He said he's never met anyone who worked as hard as he did. Uh, I think it's in you. And it's frustrating. I mean, I had the misfortune to work for a finance company when I was 32 with the most narrow-minded manager I've ever met. Uh, like they had a staff suggestion contest. They were going back to 1972 and I suggested that we could save a lot of money if we replaced our manual typewriters that had four carbon followers with electric typewriters. The one that won the competition was we go to the bank and pinch a money box. Every time we make a personal phone call, we put five cents in the money box. That was that was his thinking level. And my job there was to look after joint venture subdivisions and developments. And one Friday afternoon, I w- went out on the rounds and worked till five and went straight home. Monday mornings on my desk a note, you can't be trusted, you must not go out at all after midday on a Friday in the future. That was the level of thinking. And at that time I just happened to read Think and Grow Rich and that was a collision and it coincided. It all went bang. And then I gave myself two goals. Within a hundred days I would have my own business And the other one was I'd spend the rest of my life promulgating the Napoleon Hill principles. And there are some basics. These basics are important. When I say basics, I'm in a a different sort of basics, like success basics. Now, five weeks ago, it's 5 a.m. and I'm on Sunshine Beach with the dog. And I'm very, very worried about the new book, which is going well, very well. What if it doesn't sell? What if no one likes it? And wait a minute, principles here. If you focus on process, not outcome. Business, you focus on the process and the outcome will come. I said, right, I'm straight back 
home, started to work out all the, all the PR I needed to do. There's a book, The Slight Edge. And that's another one. I'll just do that. I'll just do five minutes more. Because that five minutes more is the difference. And gee, it's amazing. Once you start to do five minutes more, it becomes 10 minutes more. And you can achieve the most amazing things. So that's what I call basic principles, you know. That sounds so entrepreneurial, but what does Noel know about having a job? I came from a poor family. and My father always said, don't expect to get too far coming from a poor family. You're not going to be like these judges and doctors and these wealthy people on the other side of town. But he said, just be an honest, hard worker. But, the, but there's a big depression may come again and you want to have a safe, secure job. So I joined the Bank of New South Wales, I was 18, because that was Australia's oldest company. I figured that was going to be safe. And when I got into the bank, my whole goal was to become a bank accountant, <laughs> which was number two of a branch in those days. After about six months, that quickly became to become a bank manager, as I saw that I wasn't as dumb as I thought I was. And that was where I started going, I think. Having a job is no longer a safe thing. You can lose it anytime. But the ability to create value and exchange that value for money is safer than any degree certificate I have. And I have two master's degrees. Enough about me. When we come back, the basic principles of financial security. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Our aim with this audio documentary has always been to build a strong community of entrepreneurs and creatives to provide a space where they can use their voice to share their authenticity with the world. As a valued listener, your voice matters too. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. So don't be shy to let us know how we're doing in the ratings and comments. If you have a message for our production team or know someone who would be a perfect fit as a guest, you can find out more information on how to share your input at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. Hey, welcome back. Before we hear from Noel, here are some principles. Takeaway number one is to pay yourself first. Takeaway number two is that men of action are more likely to be lucky in the long run. Number three is that wealth is a function where expenses is the most important factor, not income. The fourth advice from the book is to take action when the time is right. And takeaway number five is the power of passive and exponential income. Check out the whole video in the show notes, which you can find at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. It is a brilliant seven minute video that you should really check out. Those principles are from a book that is kind of the Bible of personal finance, according to Tiago Vega, who edits this whole documentary. And now Noel will tell us about that book. I always get back to the basic principles. In George Quasson, The Richest Man in Babylon, that to me is one of the basics. A part of all you earn is yours to keep. That's not 90% of people. That to me is one of the most important basics. You know, secondly, you invest first and spend later. If you try to invest what's left over, there's never anything left over. There's no connection between income and wealth. I know some very wealthy, sorry, some very high income earners who have nothing because they spend it all. And it's more common than people think it is. Then they don't make it worse, they get divorced a couple of times, then, then it's <coughs> reverse compounding. There's a bloke we call the half, the half of the half. You know, he keeps getting divorced and it's expensive. I, I always say that there's two things. At the time I give a seminar, I've got an elephant on the screen. And the elephant's got many legs and you can't tell how many legs there are because they appear to be moving. Well, I asked the audience to count the legs and no one knows the answer. I said, those legs, the tusk, backbone, ears, trunk, tusks, 
are the unchanging fundamentals. You don't go guarantor for your kids. If someone rings you with a deal, you hang up, you know. Uh, you spend less than you earn. They're the basics. They never change. But those legs are the tax rules, pension rules, markets, products on which you need guidance. So it's a combination of the basics. And all my books go back to basics. Not everyone is handing out the same advice. This is Broke Radio 1 Extra DJ, Sideman, who tells his fans to treat their cash like Monopoly money. This is his conversation with BBC business editor, Simon Jack. So you're telling all your mates to spend all their money as soon as they get it? Obviously what I'm saying is, you get me, it's uni, you get me, you only live once, YOLO, you know about YOLO? No, what's YOLO? You only live once. It is acceptable to think that your money will not run out. Treat it like Monopoly money. But what happens when, you know, you spend all your money and then you run out, then you have a miserable time, no? Then you ask your mum for more, you know, then when you're there, obviously you ring up mumsy like, yo, mum, it's a bit peat right now. I know you're in retirement, but you need to go back to work so that I can get money, so that man can live my best life. And don't even open that TSB app because I don't want to know. Sometimes, that's why man like contactless, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. We've, we've, we've put in your pin and you're feeling the effect of your money going. When mm. you just slap that contactless on, you don't even think about it. It's like, ah, oh, what happened? It's... I don't even know it. So what do you reckon you spend most of your money on then? Food, definitely. Food? 100%. Eating out, eating, eating on out. the go. Eating on the go, I make financial mistakes. Because yeah. when I go to a shop, I order what I like, yeah. not what I can consume. You can watch the whole video and this link is in the show notes. I would be careful about that advice, even though most of us are operating, funnily enough, with that advice in mind. Back to Noel, his most famous book is Making Money Made Simple. What was the process of writing that book like? No. Four BC rang and said, "Look, we've got a spot on Saturday morning for finance at six o'clock. Oh, six o'clock Saturdays. Who's on the radio? Well, it, well, it was just after the, it was just after the fishing, and just before the scratchings. So a massive audience, a lot of wealthy guys." a wide awake at six o'clock Saturday morning. And a woman rang one day, said, look, you write good stuff in the paper, you talk good stuff. Can you um, recommend a book? Well, I said, sure, I'll check out the bookstores. Well, I checked out the bookstores. There was how to build a, how to buy a hundred homes in three years with no money down and big thick tomes with tiny print, but there was nothing. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna write one. I'll write a book. Of course, you say that, but you, but you never do. In October 85, I went to a course. It was the Vision Quest course. It was a five-day living course. And at that course, one of the exercises was to say what they would say about you at your funeral. And it came to me like a lightning bolt. My purpose was to educate ordinary people about finance. That was bang, October, 15th of October, 1985. And that was like a bolt of lightning. I've never moved moved off that rails ever since. And I agreed at that course I would write the book. Well, you know, writing a book is easier than it sounds. So on Boxing Day, 1985... My wife said, you will start the book. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, it's Christmas. No. Now, now, a book's too hard, but you can write 40 chapter headings. And I was used to writing short articles. Once I wrote down the table of contents, I had the book. But I went through the normal doubts about halfway through, it's all too hard, I'll stop, you know, stopping five feet from gold, you know, the old stuff. Yeah. And, um, and we persevered and persevered. I used a mastermind group to get the name of the book. We'd meet for a couple of hours and we agreed on making money made simple. So by December 86, a year later, I've got a manuscript 
Now, manuscript's a thick binder with paper in it. Took it around a couple of publishers. Nah, there's too many books on money now. We don't want that. So my mentor, Gordon Miles, said, well, I, I know a small publishing company, Bularong Press in Brisbane. They might look at it. So they had the manuscript. They said, well, we like it, but we got no money to do it. If you pay for it, we'll take a, a commission off the sales proceeds. So I still own the book. Some advice from Noelle's book, Making Money Made Simple. Life is full of uncertainties. Future investment earnings and interest and inflation rates are not known to anybody. However, I can guarantee you one thing. Those who put an investment program in place will have a lot more money when they come to retirement than those who never got around to it. Noelle started businessing in the real estate industry. Or maybe the better way of saying that is he learned a lot about himself when... At the age of 31, I said to my wife, I was in a recruiting office. Again, I'd been recruited to, t- to run a, a, a mail division, which was defunct. It took me 12 months to make that the biggest in the state. I just did it. And I thought, I've arrived. I'm making 100 bucks a week. I come to work in the train. I've got a corner office, you know. And my the then wife said, you can do bigger things than that. But the thinking way which was the change. And then, of course, well, what I then did, I we had a joint venture with a builder and he and I went into business in a spec building company. I had the accounting knowledge, the sales knowledge, the uh, finance knowledge, and he had the building knowledge. But... You know, a couple of months into that, we opened the real estate business and we'd sit in the office and nothing would happen. It's Sunday and the phones are not ringing. So I thought, well, we we built a display village in this cul-de-sac at Rochdale, Brisbane, Queensland. And I drove down to the cul-de-sac because I was bored and there was a young couple looking in a house window. And I sold them the house. And I thought, right, that's the future. So I had a hundred core fleet signs done about a metre by a metre, Camden Homes Arrow. We get up on Saturday morning, put a hundred of those right around the area and our street then was chock-a-block with people. I think I invented the open house in Australia or display village anyway. Uh, I think I invented the display village because nobody was doing it. Now everybody does it. It's all about noticing a need and finding a way to meet that need, just like this next story. And then in the real estate business, I noticed the local hairdresser had a weekly paid for advertorial column in the local newspaper, 400 words. And I thought, I can do that too. So I started to do an advertorial for the real estate building business 400 words. Once again, six months passes, nothing happens. Then sort of people started to notice it. Then I got a column and then I got a PR firm to get me a column in the local newspaper, so I was learning those skills. Then the REIQ saw me as someone who maybe they picked out six people as potential leaders and said, if we, if you go to Canberra, for the weekend, we will put you through a course. And three people said, haven't they got to hide? Why should we pay our way to go to Canberra? And three of us said, let's do it. And down there I met Doug Malouf, who ran the course, and one of his major principles, if you ever make a speech, the people must take something away, no matter what it was. So then the ABC rang. This is all serendipity, put it whatever you like. The ABC rang and said, look, we need someone to talk about finance. We see your stuff in the paper. Um, would you come along half past nine Sunday night? You know, it what, doesn't matter what the time is. But I said, now, wait a minute. Thinking of what Doug said, they really, I'm going to talk budgeting. They need something to look at. Now, when you do the STARS program, there's a map of the sky. Let's have a budget So I got the Sunday paper to do the budget. 
And the ABC then promoted me and the paper promoted me. Any last minute advice for us, Noel? To me, you start with where you are now. If you lost the best map, you source, if you don't know your location. So you start with where you are now. Now, what exactly have I got? Where am I? Now, where do I want to go? Now, if I'm a very low paid worker with $1,000 in the bank, I, I can't expect to own an, an, a large corporation, but I don't need to be. There's no nexus between, between happiness and money. There's a big nexus between being unhappy because you've overspent. You know, I know quite a few very poor people, but they're happy people because they live within their desires. That's the whole point. So, but if you, if you want to have more money, A, you start, we're right now, where's my superannuation? How's my house? What are my loans? You know, and then you work out your goals. Like you want to have a nice house, okay, well, that's good. If I want a nice house, how much will that cost me? Then you, then you work your goals backwards. Well, then if that's the case, I'll need to start with a house that's not that nice and get it paid off. Uh, then maybe I've, maybe I've got to save a house deposit. But, but you set the where you are now, then the target, and then the steps. It's just right in 36 chapter headings. And yet then you start with the goal, and the goal drives you. But the first principle with Napoleon Hill is desire. A lot of people don't have any desire. If you haven't got desire, I can't create it. I always said we, we hire attitude and teach skills. I can't teach attitude. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Coming up on the Psychology of Entrepreneurship, we spend hours, when I say hours, hundreds of hours into the research of this next volume. We dive deep into life and if it's okay to take one. I interviewed Noel Whitaker because for 30 years, Noel was the director of Whitaker McNaught, one of Australia's leading financial advisory companies with more than $2 billion under management. His first book, Making Money Made Simple, set sales records across the country and was named in the 100 most influential books of the 20th century. In 1988, Noel was named Australian Investment Planner of the Year. In 2003, he was awarded the Australian Centenary Medal in recognition for his services to the financial services industry. In 2011, he was made a member of the Order of Australia for service to the community in raising awareness of personal finance. He is currently an adjunct professor and executive in residence with the Queensland University of Technology, as well as a committee member advising the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, ASIC. He is a grandfather, an entrepreneur, and a friend. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kaylee Bunnyman and Tiago Vega. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Kaylee Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Love the polished audio docu-series style of this podcast, The Psychology of Entrepreneurship? At We Are Podcast, you can learn how to create a similar style for your own show. This revolutionary virtual event assembles podcasters, entrepreneurs, and marketers in one spot, so you're able to learn from the masters. Head straight to wearepodcast.com to reserve your spot at our next event.